Hey y'all, how y'all doing? Um, it's been a while since I checked in. Um, I did film a couple other um, kind of episodic things, but after going back over them again, I have decided not to post them. Um, one of them I was just hysterical. Of course, that was um, the day we put Sweetie down. And I thought it was a good idea to maybe film a little of it. Not a good idea. I'm, I'm not going to post that. And then um, the, the other ones were like right after I got sick. And uh, a couple of them, you can't even understand what I'm saying. I, I lost my voice for um, quite a while, probably about 10 days. Uh, I had no voice at all. And uh, just because of all the coughing and everything. So um, I opted out against posting uh, any of those. <clears throat> and I'm still, last night was the first night that I slept without the help, the aid of the Benadryl. I've been having to take that to um, lay down horizontally, which sucks, but, you know, because it makes you feel hungover the next day, and then you're like, you're goofy, dry, and weird, and I just hate that shit, so, um, but feeling better, so that's good. <laughs> uh, anyway, so as, um, in the last week, I think, I've been doing a lot of, um, just watching um, videos, and um, I really like um, this channel called High Intensity Health with this guy, uh, Mike Mutzel, and uh, he wrote a book um, about belly fat and stuff, and um, although, you know, I read everything, not non-specific to keto, um, I read a lot of low-fat, um, low carb, I, I try to take both sides and I take what I need. I, I take all the information in and then I just use what I need. I don't discount anybody's research just because I don't agree with it. Uh, I believe that all research is uh, fundamental in showing us what is the truth. So uh, I think that uh, Mike takes that same approach um, and he does interview primarily people that are, uh, you know, drank the Kool-Aid and uh, maybe not so much keto, but uh, more of a, a low-carb, uh, maybe higher fat or higher protein um, diets. And there's a lot of uh, hormonal and exercise-related videos, um, but I really, I recommend him, um, High Intensity Health. Um, and it's a lot of really science-based stuff. He doesn't go off conjecture, um, and nothing is assumed. So all of all of his videos, he really tries to get to you know um, the science of it, which is what I like. So anyway, um, I was looking at a video yesterday, and. They were talking about white white fat and brown fat and how they um, are uh, metabolically different. Uh, white fats for storage. Brown fat is uh, tra traditionally, uh, historically, I guess, scientifically, that is what is more metabol metabolically active, and it actually burn it produces heat. So um, that's why infants, uh, because they have a lot of brown fat, uh, don't shiver when you take them out of the tub uh, automatically. They, they have a much higher percentage of brown fat, whereas somebody with a really low body fat, uh, I guess like me, um, I'm in the water, like when we went to Honduras and, and went diving, uh, I was shaking so bad. Uh, I don't have a lot of brown fat that creates a lot of heat, and therefore um, I get cold quick and I stay cold. So, um, but I was looking at the research around that and um, some of this stuff, um, ice baths and things like that to uh, stimulate your brown fat and to stimulate your white fat 
to become more metabolic, metabolically active. So um, there's a theory that um, doing these ice baths or dropping your core temperature, not going hypothermic, but doing these uh, jumping into a lake that's really cold and staying there until you start shivering, that somehow that activates um, your white fat to become not brown fat, because that's not how it works, but to become more metabolically active and become more like brown fat. Anyway, um, interesting, to say the least. Uh, another thing that I was um, noticing while I was in bed a lot uh, was the amount of commercials for, in my area at least, um, weight loss surgery on TV for um, local hospitals. I'd never seen that before, not for weight loss surgery. And the amount of drugs targeting uh, not just diabetics, but now weight loss, like this contrave bullshit. Uh, yeah, you want to look into these. Don't take anything as a magic bullet, because I'll tell you what, um, just like 10, 15 years ago, you know, when when I thought, oh, yeah, uh, I'm going to take, you know, um, Fen, you know, whatever the Fen was at that time that my doctor would prescribe or that you could buy over the counter that made your heart just race and was full of caffeine and amphetamines, basically, trying to get you to lose weight. And, of course, it's going to take your appetite away because it completely screws your system. So um, this contrave one is really just a mixture of two um, drugs that were currently on the market that they are now marketing, um, saying that this is the next big thing. If you look at the research behind uh, contrave, no significant difference. It's very underwhelming, um, the, the study they did. And uh, definitely look into it because a lot of these side effects will negatively impact you, um, especially your, uh, you will feel nauseous all the time. It'll make you dizzy and it screws up your liver and your kidneys. And just, you know, always look into the medications, you know, no matter what anybody says about it. Uh, oh, I lost 10 pounds on this. 10 pounds is, is not hard to lose. Weight Watchers even tells you they will give you 10 pounds for free because they know that right now you're probably eating a really high-carb diet and they're going to put you on something that's lower carb. So they know that just by doing that, you're going to drop weight. And getting 10 pounds off of somebody that's already obese is not hard. It really isn't. I dieted my whole life. I did a thousand different programs, and I could always get off 10 pounds. That was simple. It wasn't getting the weight off. It's sustaining the way, of you, the way that you eat. So, because 80% of it is the food you put in your body. You have to remember that. 80%. You have to change the way you think about food. You have to change your rituals around food. And I still have these issues myself, and I've been doing this for a long time. But really, that is the core. Anytime anybody asks me for any advice around weight loss, I ask them, what are you doing now? Because what you do now is what's going to determine what you do in the future, unless you can change some of those behaviors based around your schedule or your life or whatever. And will it last forever? No. Just like anything else, you have to do maintenance to your program, to the way you think, to the rituals involved in keeping you sustainable. Because life happens, shit happens, people move, babies are born, people get divorced, people die, you have these huge stressors in your life, and that will change how you feel about food at that moment. It can. 
especially if historically you've had issues. So you have to keep that in mind um, when, you know, when you're doing this, when you're changing rituals and when you're looking for something that you can sustain. Um, that's something you have to look at. It's lifetime. It's not, boom, I'm going to change this behavior and I'm good to go the rest of my life. It doesn't work that way. Um, it's an ongoing thing. You have to continuously uh, update, let's say. You know, uh, I updated from low, low carb to keto. But when I got into keto, doing militant keto for me for the first year worked fantastic. After the first year, not so much. I kept dropping weight, so I had to kind of tweak my program. You have to keep tweaking things and learn what works best for your body. 20 grams of carbs may not work for you. And research shows that women over 40 have a harder time losing weight with just 20 carbs. It sounds funny, but uh, if you look at some of the research, sometimes some women, because of our hormones and whatnot at that age group, or maybe you've had a hysterectomy, or maybe your system's really damaged, maybe your body is not cooperating on a baseline level, you know. Um, and I love fasting. So for me, fasting is what gives your body a chance to go, okay, we're going to cut off all the food. I know that sounds scary, right? But we're going to cut off all the food. And we're going to give your body a chance to release the hormones that it needs just to run this body without food. And really, it works. Right now, I'm going to fast. So I, last time I ate was like 6 p.m. yesterday. And it's noon the next day, right? I'm not hungry because I'm fat adapted. My body knows that when all the carbohydrates are gone, which for me doesn't take long because I don't eat a lot of carbohydrates. So once all the glucose is gone out of my muscles and my liver, it just, boom, switches right over to fat. And, and I know that and I can feel it now. And what it does is my intestinal tract just slows right down slows down. I feed it a lot of water, I give it some salt, I take a magnesium at night, I make sure that, you know, I feel okay, I'm not dizzy or nauseous or anything like that. I did work out this morning and it did feel good, but I'm used to that. I'm used to working out fasted. You may not want to do that because it may make, make you nauseous and um, deplete some of your uh, electrolytes and whatnot. I went really slow this morning. I did have a run at the end, but um, but I feel good and and I feel strong and I feel like I'm probably not going to eat lunch. I'll probably drink a couple more bottles of water, get on with my day, and maybe tonight. When my husband gets home, I may have green salad. Green salad and maybe some protein. Uh, and the only reason I do that, it wouldn't be because I was starving or I was hungry, but it, it would be because I like the probiotic effect of leafy greens and raw veg in my belly to keep my my gut biome healthy and for me that's important since I have an altered digestive tract and I have a smaller belly um, and I don't absorb the way most people do it's good for me to have veg in there I could go without dinner uh, I could I could just drink water the rest of the day and get up tomorrow morning and see how I feel then and maybe I wouldn't be hungry then either. I've got 22% uh, body fat, so I have plenty to live off of. I would not starve to death. And, you know, fasting gives my body a chance to work on other things. You know, uh, lets my blood insulin, my glucose level out 
Uh, my insulin, I have no spiking. My insulin just stays nice and steady. And um, my other hormones have a chance to work and do what they're supposed to do. And I just feel good when I fast. Now some people say, oh my God, how can you do that? It's not healthy. It's not... Uh, think about your ancestors, you know. I'm talking way back. You know, uh, there were no stores, there was no bread, uh, nobody was farming. We were catching animals when we could, eating those, and then starving, basically fasting until the next time you could catch another animal. That's really how we worked best. There were no fat cavemen, you know, and uh, functional movement, um, you know, getting out and doing functional stuff like, uh, you know, hiking and uh, swimming and, you know, things where you're m using your whole body rather than just standing on a treadmill walking, which is, if that's all you can do, then that's all you can do. But uh, what I'm saying is what's better for you is to go outside, you know, um, walk in regular terrain, um, you know, play with your kids, um, run after a ball, play a sport, you know, something where you're using all of your body parts and not just, you know, your legs or, you know, lifting weights is good too. I mean, lifting things and picking heavy stuff up is good for your muscles, good for your bone structure, um, definitely. I don't lift heavy anymore because it's too hard on my joints and I want my joints to last. So I lift very light and I just rep until failure, which these days is not much. Uh, I do four sets of 20 maybe. Yesterday I worked my abs. I just do a lot of isolation stuff, um, you know, sit-ups, uh, squatting, leg ups just uh and i know it's working when the next day i have not pain but i'm sore so i know i'm working things and i'm breaking muscle down and rebuilding so um you know you don't have to go full bore especially at my age all right well i just wanted to make a video check in see how y'all were doing um make sure you're getting in um, enough veg. I, I really worry about women who cut out veg uh, and then they complain about being constipated. You know, water is your number one. Uh, number two is veg. Uh, flaxseed meal, chia seeds, you know, sprinkle that shit on everything because uh, it will serve you in keeping you moving. Uh, colace, don't be afraid to take colace every night and magnesium at night too will really help you keep things moving along. Um, stay away from juice, stay away from fruit, you know, um, too much meat. I find a protein heavy more than 70 grams a day will also bind you up. Um, meat takes a lot of energy in your gut to process and so move slower and uh, you're going to find that you're going to have better luck with your constipation if you add more water, eat more veg, and, you know, occasionally add in a plain Greek yogurt. I love uh, F-A-G-E, phage, phage, however you pronounce it. Um, for me, th those are the best tasting. Um, there's another one, a new one called uh, kefir, kefir cup. And um, it's a heavy kind of Greekish yogurt-ish. It's got a different taste to it. It's really tangy. You could always add um, a couple berries to it or mix something else in with it if you don't like the taste of it. But I find that that populates my microbiome and it really helps with keeping everything kind of moving along because um, that's how you're getting rid of stuff. Uh, through your breath, and through urine and feces, that's how you get rid of fat. That's how it leaves your body. So you want to make sure all those systems work really well. So anyway, um, that's it for now. I will um, attempt to make another video soon. Y'all take care now. Bye.